Hey guys, welcome into lecture number 18 of Religion 102, where we're going to talk about 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So let me have a word of prayer and then we'll get right to it. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity you've given me once again to teach, and I pray for every student who's watching this right now. God, that you would uh, give them great joy today because of Jesus and all that he is for us. I pray, Father, that you would continually reveal the truth of the gospel to each student, that, uh, that they might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given me um, to minister to them through this class. And I pray, Father, that you would open up our hearts, our minds, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, so that we may behold wonderful things from your word. May every word that comes from my mouth come directly from the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Let it be nothing in and of myself. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, switching things up with format here just a little bit. Uh, the audio is a little different. I apologize for that, uh, but um, it probably doesn't sound near as crisp as it did on the last videos. Not sure. As long as you can hear me, that's all that matters, all right? So I'm going to get you the information anyway. Uh, you should have been able to get your handout uh, on the class notes there, on the classroom work on Google Classroom. So if you're ready to fill in your handout, I'm ready to go. So here we go, first and second. Thessalonians, let's get right, right to it, written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is what we're looking at first, so make sure you've got that. Uh, written uh, roughly A.D. 49 to 51. Now, Paul wrote this first letter to the Thessalonian church just a few months after having preached in the city of Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. We talked about that back when we were looking at the book of Acts. Upon leaving the church at Thessalonica under, under duress, Paul, Silas, uh, and Timothy, by the way, traveled to Athens by way of Berea. But after that, their time was short in Athens. Paul felt the need to receive a report from the newborn church in Thessalonica. So he sent Timothy back to serve and minister to the new believers there. Uh, Paul wanted to check on the state of the Thessalonians' faith for fear that false teachers might have infiltrated their number. However, Timothy soon returned with a very good report, prompting Paul to open 1 Thessalonians as a letter of encouragement to new believers. Why is 1 Thessalonians so important? 1 Thessalonians provides Christians with the clearest biblical uh, passage provides Christians with the clearest biblical passage on the coming rapture of believers, an event that will inaugurate the seven-year tribula tribulation. Now, at the, at the rapture, that is when, when Christ returns and, and uh, those who are remaining are called up to be with him, at the rapture, Christ will, will return for his people. The dead in Christ will rise first, while those still living will follow close behind all believers will meet Jesus in the air to begin an, an eternity spent with the Lord. We know this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Let's take a look at Paul's purpose in writing 1 Thessalonians together. Uh, these, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give these to you. Um, they, they're all going to obviously are on the screen at the same time. Paul's purpose in writing 1 Thessalonians, first of all, to restore the believer's hope in the wake of, an, of the unexpected deaths of people in their congregation. They, they had experienced a lot of, a lot of tragedy, um, but Paul is writing to comfort them, and, uh, and, and as it says, to restore the hope that they have. Second of all, to encourage them that persecution is normal for the Christian. You know, what Jesus even said, if... If you are going to follow me, that don't, he said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. If, if it hated me, it's going to hate you too, all right? And so when it comes to persecution, we, we got to know that we live in a world that's broken, and the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, is directly in opposition to our pride. And so people don't like being told they're wrong. They don't like being told that the way they choose to live is sinful, um, and, and, and we need to do so in a, in a loving and a caring way, not in a way that shoves a Bible down their throat, but at the same time, not in a way that devalues the reality that God is holy and must judge sin. All right, We need to love somebody enough to let them know that, uh, like for instance, th think of it this way. When, I, um, when I'm sharing the gospel with someone, how much would I have to hate this person to believe that if they die without faith in Jesus, they're going to go to hell and not tell them that. 
You see, see where I'm going? And, and so this is the message of the gospel is offensive to our pride, and that brings about a lot of persecution. And, and the church at Thessalonica was dealing with major persecution. We're talking about major persecution in Paul's time, which would eventually lead to Paul's own death at the hands of Nero. And, and we've talked in class before about how, uh, how crazy... Nero would, would persecute believers. And then, and then finally, to exhort them to take responsibility for earning their own living. Man, man as believers, we need, to be, we need to be beneficial members of society. Our, our community, uh, I, th- I think it might have been, um, I, I can't remember who said it, I'm gonna, it's not in my notes and I'm probably going to misquote them, but, but basically our communities should be better because we, as Christians, are in them, and we're active, and we're, we're not just behind our clo- the closed doors of our church. Uh, I can't remember who said it but, it, but it was, if your church closed its doors today, would your community even notice? Or would, would, would the community even notice, or would they even care? And so, so my prayer is that as, as believers, we would make, take responsibility, yes, for make, to make an honest uh, living, but to be impactful members of our community as well. All right, let's take a look at some key themes in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And I'm going to give, I'll give these to you all at the same time. The first three are here. Jesus' death and resurrection are the basis for the Christian hope. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, then everything we believe in is meaningless. All right. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, then the Bible is just a book. That's all it is. But there, his, his body has never been found. There have been over 500 uh, eyewitnesses who saw him risen from the dead. And we have accounts of his um, resurrection in Scripture. And so until someone finds the body of Jesus, uh, the Bible stands strong. And it will always stand strong because he is not there, for he is risen. Second of all, Christians are destined not for wrath, but for salvation at Jesus' coming. When Jesus returns... Uh, he will separate the sheep from the goats. He said, "There, um, there will, there will be. Uh, he, he will go out and he will weed through the garden. He will bring in the harvest and he will burn the weeds." He gives all these analogies throughout the Gospels, but but what he's saying is, those who do not possess faith in Jesus, those who have not submitted to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ, they will face the wrath of for their own sin. And those who do trust in, in, in what Christ has done for us, His atoning work on the cross, and His death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus is the one that paid for our sin. Jesus is the one who faced wrath for our sin. And so Christians are destined not for wrath, but for salvation at Jesus' is coming. Uh, number three, Christians who die will, partake, will participate fully in the second coming because it says the dead in Christ will rise first. All right, so they will be given glorified bodies at the time that Christ returns. And eventually, that's what we will all end up with in heaven for all eternity. We'll no longer be in this corruptible flesh. Uh, let's move on here. Number four, Christians must never neglect their responsibility to work. And that, that comes back to being a, a beneficial member to society. All right, we, we should, Our community should be better because we are there. And we should work because... It has been granted to us to work. You know, this, this is part of that happened after, after a result of the fall that um, we're, we're to work the ground. Now, it's going to be harder. But even before that, man, man, even before the fall, before Genesis 3, Adam was given the responsibility to take care of the garden. So, so work has always been something that is, that is ingrained in us that we need to do. And, and when we do it, we feel accomplished. And so we are to work, and we are to work hard, and we we are to work well because if, if you do anything as a believer, do it well for the glory of God because He deserves the praise and 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 the adoration that comes from our hard work. Not not back to us, but to Him be the glory. Uh, joy, another key theme. Joy, especially in suffering, is a mark of the Christian. You know, it, it's it's an amazing thing when we when we suffer for persecution that we can still have joy in the midst of that persecution. And that's not because our circumstances are great. They're not. But we can have joy because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is risen because that because we have an eternity waiting on us forever in heaven, we can have joy in the midst of seemingly horrible circumstances. And then finally, number six, faith, hope, and love are essential and universal traits of the Christian. 
Faith, hope, and love, Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 13, these three remain, but the greatest of these, he says, is love. These are traits that are seen throughout the Christian life. Now, let's move on to 2 Thessalonians. The book of 2 Thessalonians, of course, it's, it's, the, it's the sequel written by Paul. And it was written uh, A.D. 49 to 51 as well. Kind of, kind of in the, in, it was in the same time frame that we, he would have wrote in 1 Thessalonians. Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians shortly after writing the first letter since the subject matter of the second letter has a number of thematic similarities to the first. Paul probably had received a second report from the city detailing con these continuing questions or problems regarding the end times. And so several of Paul's references... Um, in Thessalonians indicate that uh, that the church there uh, were prob or, or that people were probably misleading these new believers even to the point that false teachers were forging letters to make them look as if they had come from Paul and, and we know this from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2 the apostles therefore took extra care in this letter to make sure that the Thessalonians understood not only uh, his views on the end times but also what his handwriting looked like so that they would be able to identify letters as authentically his. And we see this in chapter 3 and verse 17. Uh, why is the book of Thess uh, 2 Thessalonians so important? 2 Thessalonians distinguishes itself by the detailed teaching it presents on the end times. Now, now false teachers had been presenting fake letters as if Paul had written them, telling the Thessalonian believers that the day of the Lord had already come. This would have been especially you know, troubling for them um, because Paul had encouraged them in, a in his previous letter that they would be raptured before the day of wrath came upon the earth. So Paul explains to them that this future time of tribulation had not yet come because a certain man of lawlessness, who would be the Antichrist, had not yet been revealed. We see this from chapter 2 and verse 3. Comparison with other passages in like Daniel and Matthew and, and Revelation reveal uh, this to be the Antichrist. Excuse me. But Paul encourages, he encourages the Thessalonians not to worry because the Antichrist would not come until a uh, mysterious restrainer, the, the Thessalonians apparently knew his identity, uh, was removed from the earth, 2 Second Thess uh, Second Thessalonians 2, 6, and 7. Uh, the identity of this restrainer has been heavily debated, though due to the nature of the work of the restrainer does, he is likely the Holy Spirit of God re working redemptively through the church. And then when believers leave the earth in rapture, all who remain will experience the wrath of tribulation. Uh, let's take a look at Paul's purposes in writing 2 Thessalonians. Uh, first of all, to reassure those terrified by the thought that the day of the Lord had already come. Uh, secondly, to strengthen the Thessalonians in the face of a relentless persecution. Some of, some of these are overlapping from 1 Thessalonians as well. Uh, thirdly, to deal with the problem of some of the church members refusing to earn their own living. Again, this is... Uh, again, reminiscent of what he had written previously, and, and some of them still weren't doing it, so he was he was driving it home all the more and calling them into account. Uh, now let's take a look at some key themes, key themes of the book of Second Thessalonians. And and I know I know I'm going kind of quick here, so if you need to pause this and fill out your handout, by all means, you got the freedom to do that. You can shut me up, you can mute me if you want to, and just write down what's on the screen. You can fast forward if you want to. Yeah, I'm giving you all that all that. I'm. Normally I wouldn't say that. But you know what? It's you, man. It's you. Have at it. Um, you're only going to get as much out of this as you want to get out of it. All right? Uh, some key themes to the book of 2 Thessalonians. God's righteous judgment will be fully manifest when Jesus returns. And for the believer, man, that is going to be a fabulous day and an amazing day. But for the unbeliever, man, it should terrify us. It should terrify you if you're an unbeliever that the full righteous judgment of God will be manifested when Jesus returns. Second of all, the lawless one, the, the Antichrist, the lawless one's revelation and humanity's final rebellion are prerequisites for Jesus' second coming. Thirdly, the lawless one will deceive all those who have rejected the gospel, guaranteeing their condemnation when Jesus returns. And then finally, number four, Christians must not exploit the charity of fellow Christians. Uh, we need to act like believers, man. We need to act like people who follow Jesus. Guys, I appreciate you uh, joining me for this very 
quick jet through of First and Second Thessalonians. Yes, we could have spent a lot more time talking about a lot more things, but uh, but this is for the purpose of your handout. This is for the purpose to prepare you for the final coming up in a few weeks. Guys, thank you for your attention. Uh, please remember to make sure to watch the overview video, the, the videos that I've included in your classwork, and make sure you've got that handout filled out. I'll see you on the next lecture.